So this is the first Sunday of Advent. And by now, Christmas carols have already taken over the radio airwaves. Christmas decorating is in full swing. Christmas plans are being made. Christmas gifts are being bought. Christmas cards are being sent. And all of those wonderful things are happening. Here at Memorial, we're going to take a little break from the book of Acts. We have been going through that for a little while now, but we're going to take a break over the next uh, month. And we're going to spend the next four Sundays looking at Advent from the perspective of the prophet Isaiah. We're going to look at uh, four different passages from Isaiah in the next month, all dealing with the promise of the coming Messiah. And we're going to start this morning with the most pivotal chapter in the book of Isaiah, chapter 40. Now, Isaiah is a a, a pretty fascinating prophet, in my opinion, for a number of reasons. Uh, I think Isaiah might just be my favorite Old Testament prophet, uh, at least for now, until we we study a different one. But uh, one of the reasons that I love Isaiah is because I feel like the gospel shines so brightly in the book of Isaiah. Uh, From from the call of Isaiah in chapter 6, to his pictures of Christ as the suffering servant, it seems so clear that Isaiah is pointing the people of Israel ahead to their coming Savior. Uh, One of the commentaries that I've been reading on the book of Isaiah is actually called The Gospel of Isaiah, because the good news is so clear in Isaiah. In Isaiah, we have a prophet who is clear not only about judgment that our sin deserves, but also about the glory, the mercy, the grace of God that's available to all who receive his promised Messiah. So we're going to look at, at chapter 40 today. Uh, chapter 40 is not obviously not the beginning of the book. It's, it's right in the middle. And, and this is what you need to know going into it. Uh, there's, there's two main sections in the book of Isaiah. There's, there's chapter 1 through 39, and then there's chapter chapters 40 through 46. And the first 39 chapters tell us mostly about events that are happening during Isaiah's lifetime. And, and there are prophecies of the future interspersed throughout those first 39 chapters, but but much of it has to do with things that happened in his lifetime. Uh, Isaiah lived about 700 years before Jesus was born, and and so most of that first half of the book has to do with, with his period of time. But then chapters 40 through 66 skip ahead a little bit. Uh, And and they look a little bit farther into the future. Most of the the second half of Isaiah has to do with the exile. And the exile exile happened more than 100 years after Isaiah's lifetime. It goes into more detail about what the, the eventual coming Messiah would be like. The four servant songs of Isaiah, you might be familiar with those, are they're in the second half of the book. So Isaiah 40 is is this really important transition that happens in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 40 is when the prophet goes from primarily dealing with his own time to looking at prophetic visions of what God is going to do in the future to redeem and save his people. So Isaiah 40 is kind of like a bridge. It's a bridge for the people of God from the already to the not yet. It's a bridge from living in this messed up, sin-cursed world of today to the beautiful glorious redemption that God has planned for his people. So with all of these thoughts in mind, let's hear from the gospel of Isaiah. Will you join me in standing, if you're able, for the reading of God's word? Be reading Isaiah chapter 40, verses 1 through 11. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. This is the word of the Lord. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries, in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry. And I said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers. 
The flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Go on up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up, fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. Behold, the Lord God comes with might and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. You pray with me. O Lord, your word does indeed stand forever. As we enter the Advent season this year, we pray that you would show us where true comfort comes from. Father, show us this morning a glimpse of your glory, that our souls would be nourished by your unchanging word. Please pour out your spirit on us this morning, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. We have four points that we're going to look at from this passage as we go through this morning. Uh, Number one, a people who need comforted. Number two, preparing the way. Number three, glory that fades. And number four, true glory revealed. So what people was this passage written to? Who was this written to? And and why did they need comforting? You know, there's actually some debate among scholars of the Bible about this. And just to give a little bit more historical context, Isaiah had identified himself as as a prophet of the southern kingdom of Judah during the time of Israel's divided kingdom. It was, uh, in fact, coming toward the end of that time of the divided kingdom. In Isaiah's lifetime, the northern kingdom of Israel was conquered and destroyed in the year 722 B.C. The Assyrians came and conquered Israel. Isaiah references his relationships with several of Judah's kings during that time uh, in the first half of the book. Uh, But after chapter 40, Isaiah speaks with with detail about the exile to Babylon. He even identifies Cyrus the Great as the king who would allow the exiles eventually to return to the promised land, but but that didn't happen until 538 B.C., almost 200 years after the prophet's lifetime. So so what's going on? Who is is this passage talking to? Well, the answer there is is pretty simple, actually. Verse 1 tells us, Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. This is a message of comfort to God's people, no matter what period of time they live in, whether it was before the exile, during the exile, after it, God's people were oppressed. In the beginning of the book of Isaiah, the the people of Judah were under constant threat from the the king of Assyria. He had already conquered their their cousins in the north, and, and now he came and he had destroyed everything in Judah except for the capital city of Jerusalem. But God prevented Assyria. From conquering Jerusalem. And that's a story for another day. Uh, but for, for those who would live after Isaiah's lifetime, they would discover that it wasn't Assyria that, that, would, that would conquer them, but, but Babylon, who finally came and conquered Judah and took them all into exile. Isaiah had actually predicted that this would happen, but his prophetic voice wasn't heard. Uh, He had even told King Hezekiah, he he had said to King Hezekiah, Babylon is going to come and conquer Jerusalem soon after your life is over. Isaiah tells the king in chapter 39, he says, Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and, and that which your fathers have stored up until now shall be carried off to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. Some of your own sons who will come after you, whom you will father, shall be taken away. They will be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Isaiah told them that was coming. There were dark days ahead. There were challenging times ahead. And the king that he had told that to, Hezekiah, said in in chapter 39, verse 8, Oh, the word of the Lord that you've spoken is good. For he thought, at least there will be peace and security in my days. Uh, One Isaiah scholar, Alan McRae, wrote this. He, He wrote, It is one thing to talk about the troubles of a distant nation. It is quite another to look at your own people and to know that they are headed toward misery and suffering. 
Not only would Isaiah have felt this way, but many godly people in Judah who considered Isaiah a true prophet and accepted his words as coming from God himself knew without doubt that terrible suffering and exile lay ahead. In the middle of these circumstances, Isaiah brought them a message of comfort and deliverance. Isaiah, Isaiah wrote these words knowing that not only were the people of God going through difficulty at the time, but that worse days were ahead. You know, I can't tell you how many times recently I've heard people predicting doom and gloom for all of us in the days ahead. Uh, you know, I, I would guess that probably many of you have heard it too. Uh, I, I think we all know that, that we've lived through some very trying circumstances in the last couple of years. Uh, we've lived through some things that, that our, our country hasn't, hasn't seen before. Uh, if someone would have told me the day that I, that I moved here to be your pastor, what, what the next two years would hold, I don't think I would have believed you. Uh, in the last two and a half years, we've been through a global pandemic. We've had massive economic disruptions. We've had the deepest racial tensions in 60 years, at least. A disputed election and deep divisions in our nation. Uh, almost 800,000 people in our nation, in our nation alone, have died from COVID. That's more than twice the number of Americans who died in the Second World War. More than 10 million people have lost jobs or changed jobs due to the pandemic. Uh, more than 30 million Americans, almost 10% of our nation, have, have moved during the pandemic. And that's all in the last two and a half years. We've been through all of that. And now I'm, I'm hearing people say, well, it's just going to get worse. Uh, maybe you've heard that too. And I don't know what's going to happen. I'm not a prophet. But forget about the national problems for a moment. I think we all know that, that these issues aren't things that are just out there on the news. They, they affect all of our lives, haven't they? Our lives have, have all changed. Uh, some of us have lost friends and loved ones in the last couple of years from COVID. Some of us have lost jobs. For one reason or another, all of us are dealing with economic fallout. Our money doesn't seem to stretch as far as it once did. Some of us may, might be wondering if we're going to be able to pay the bills. Uh, and that, that doesn't even begin to deal with the, the deep divisions that are happening even in our own families. I know that there have been many families that have had sharp disagreements over the last year or two from everything from politics to vaccines. Some of us have had these discussions in our own families. Some of us have had it in, ex in our extended families. And, and it just doesn't seem like things are going to get better anytime soon. When God spoke to Isaiah, he gave a message for people who were distressed and people who were preparing for even greater turmoil. He said to Isaiah, comfort, comfort my people says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Cry to her that her warfare is ended, her iniquity, her sin is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. What is God trying to tell his people here? He's, he's comforting them even though things are about to get worse and not better. He, he has a good plan for his people in spite of all the trouble around them. How can he say that? How can he say something like that? I mean, what, what is this all about? What, what does it even mean? Especially when it says she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. I mean, that doesn't sound comforting. That almost sounds like judgment. What does that mean? Well, that, that one statement there, double for all her sins, I think that's actually finishing the thought of the previous statement when he says her warfare is ended, her iniquity is pardoned, she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. I believe it's talking about double pardon for all her sins, an abundant pardon. He says that the war is over. How can, how can he say that? How can Isaiah say that? You know, it, it, it sounds comforting, but, but how does that deal with the reality of the coming exile? How does that help us if the circumstances of our lives look like they're getting worse and not better? Well, we need to see what God is doing here. How is God going to end this war? And how is the Lord going to provide a double pardon? So let's look at the next chapter. The next chapter, verse 40 says, A voice cries, In the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight a desert, in the desert, a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every, plant, every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. 
and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. How can God's people be comforted? How will the warfare be ended and sins pardoned? Here's the answer. The Lord himself will come and do it. That's what verse 3 is telling us. Prepare the way for the Lord, because he's coming to set things right. Verse 10 says it again. Behold, the Lord God comes with might, and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his recompense before him. The glory of the Lord is going to be revealed, and everyone will see it. He is coming, Isaiah says. So get ready. Prepare the way. The Lord's telling Isaiah here that the comfort for his people is that he himself will come. He will end the wars. He will pardon iniquity with a double pardon above and beyond any sin that we've committed. He's coming. So get ready. You know, and and we might say along with the people of Israel, well, that sounds great, but what about my life right now? What about what about my my bills? What about my family? What about this pandemic? Isaiah's words just seem so far from reality. But here's what Isaiah is saying to us right now. What we see in front of us is not all that there is to reality. He says, where there was once only desert land, there will be a highway for a coming king. Where there was once a valley, where there was once a mountain, there will be flat land. Where we see mountains and valleys, God sees a highway. God is so dedicated to fulfilling his promises to his people that he will literally move mountains in order to keep his promises. What look to us like impassable, immovable objects, mountains, valleys, will get out of the way when the king comes. The mountains and the valleys that surround our lives, the the bills that we can't pay, the relationships that are broken, the big problems that just seem like they can't be fixed, those things that, that fill our lives with anxieties, none of them are too great for our God to overcome. The deepest reality is not that our lives are filled with with fear and worry. The deepest reality is that God is going to move mountains and fill valleys in order to accomplish his purpose for his people. And what is that purpose? Verse 5 tells us, The glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. The Lord will reveal his glory, and no human hand can stop it. No mountain of human problems will derail the plan and the purpose of the Lord. The Lord will reveal his glory by coming himself to pardon the sins of his people. He himself will come to end all the wars. That's what Isaiah is saying to the Israelites here. To the people of Judah, yes, yes, your heart might, your, your life might be hard right now. Yes, it, it's going to get even harder. You'll have to go into exile for a time. You're going to have to live under a foreign power. You're going to lose your lands and your property. Uh, You'll be separated from members of your family and, and from your ancestral home. You'll have to live under an oppressive pagan government. It's going to be hard, but be comforted. God himself is coming. He has not forgotten you. He has not abandoned you. He is coming to end the wars and to redeem his people and nothing and no one can stop him. His glory will be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. He has spoken and his word is trustworthy. That was his message for the people of Judah through Isaiah. He wanted his people to know it then and he wants us to know it now. But it is easy to forget, isn't it? You know, we're all influenced every day by many, many voices. The things that we see in front of us, the the things that we read in social media, the things that we hear on the news, the things that we hear from our neighbors, from each other. Too often we trust simply in our our own senses and in our own views or in the views of someone that we know rather than what God's word says. And I get it. In the midst of, of hard situations, when we've been diagnosed with cancer or when it looks like the economy is falling apart or when a loved one walks, walks out on us, we, we tend to just want somebody to come and, and make it all better. Uh, we, when we're in pain, sometimes we, we stop caring so much about what is true and righteous and good and, and we just want the pain to go away. We, we just want our lives to go back to normal, whatever, whatever normal is. And the human tendency is to look for some human solution that will make that happen for us. 
We end up looking for, for all kinds of false saviors, people who say that they're going to make it right and make the problems go away. We look at the people who look like they have it all together and, and, and they say that they can make the problems better again. So we look for, for all kinds of saviors, political saviors who say they'll fix the economy. We look to relationship saviors who say they can fix our broken relationships or medical saviors who can fix our physical problems for us. But none of these can really do all the things that we need them to do. The glory of human saviors will fade away. Isaiah tells us in verse 6, All flesh is grass, and all its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades when the, the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. All the glories of all the false saviors will fail. Like the petals of a flower falling down to the ground, our, our human solutions will fail. Human glories will pass away, but the word of God will stand forever. You know, I'm sure that we can all think of uh, somebody that we've known once or, or some, some person that we thought was just full of promise. We thought this person is going to be perfect for this job. They're, they're going to be a perfect fit and, and they're going to fix it. They're going to make it all right. But, but then they turned out to be a fraud or a failure. In Isaiah's time, the people of Judah were looking to Egypt for help. They thought that, that the strength of Egypt, this nation on the other side, away from Assyria, that, that Egypt could come and, and save them from Assyria. But, but Egypt couldn't. Egypt couldn't help them. When, when the Assyrians came and laid siege to Jerusalem, no Egyptian would come to help. Isaiah had said to the people in chapter 31, Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help and rely on horses those who trust in chariots because they are many and in horsemen because they are very strong. But do not look to the Holy One of Israel or consult the Lord. Friends, have we become too quick to trust in the glories of men to save us when only God can? Do we trust in men to fix our broken governments? Do we look at members of our family and think, well, if only my husband did this or if only my wife did this or if only my, my children did what I asked them, then, then my problems would be solved. Do we place expectations on people that are too high for them? The grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass. We are frail human beings. Every one of us. A hundred years from now, we will all be gone. The world will keep on going unless Christ has returned first. All the glories of men and women will pass away. Our hope cannot be in human flesh. It will all fail. We need a greater hope. We need a greater hope. Isaiah points us to one. In verse 8, he says, The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Isaiah shows us a glory that does not fade. The true glory of God will be revealed. He says then in verse 9, Go on up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice and with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news, lift it up, fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. Behold, the Lord God comes with might and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. Isaiah's message is that true glory will be revealed when the Lord himself comes to save his people. The people of Judah and Israel were looking forward to that day. They were waiting for their glorious Messiah to be revealed. And, and we know that God kept his promise. We know that 700 years after Isaiah, there, there would be a man who would be wandering out in the wilderness. And this man would wear camel's hair and eat locusts and honey and he called people to repent. And when the people asked this strange man who he was and what he was doing, he said in John 1.23, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, just as the prophet Isaiah said. It was John the Baptist, the herald of good news. He was the one to say to the cities of, Jer of Judah, behold your God. Behold, the Lord God comes with might and his arm rules for him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. 
He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. 700 years before John the Baptist, before the birth of Jesus Christ, Isaiah is saying, your Messiah will come in glory, and this is what his glory will look like. He will be a good shepherd. He will tend his flock. He will gather up the lambs in his strong arms. He will carry them. He will gently lead those who are young. This is what true glory looks like. This is what our Messiah, Jesus Christ, looks like. He is strong enough to conquer. He's strong enough to conquer his enemies, and he is tender enough to love them. And in fact, that is exactly what he does with us. Our sin would make us enemies of God. Our sin would make us opposed to him. And in those, in those moments when we've abandoned all hope in Jesus, in those moments that we've looked for human saviors to save us and to help us instead of God, we've actually acted as enemies of God himself. The Messiah that Isaiah shows us is mighty. He is, he is one who could simply come and subdue us or even destroy us as enemies, but he doesn't. Instead, as a good shepherd, he leaves the 99 to go after the one sheep that is lost. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. This is our glorious God and Savior. His glory will not pass away. Yes, Jesus would come in human flesh as a man. John tells us that Jesus is the word of God made incarnate. Jesus is the, the glorious, eternal word of God, made one with human flesh. He is fully man and fully God. John 1.14 says that the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Friends, this is why we can be comforted. Jesus came to end the war and to give an abundant pardon. What, what war is that even talking about? Well, how does he give us a pardon? It, it seems like there's still lots of wars going on, but this is what Isaiah means. It, for the people of God who belong to Jesus Christ, we are no longer at war with God. We are no longer his enemies. We've been pardoned. For those who've come to Jesus in repentance and faith, acknowledging him as the true and only Savior, we have comfort for all eternity. He is the word of God who will stand forever. He said in Matthew 24, 35, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. His glory will not fail. His promises will not fade. Jesus has moved heaven and earth to accomplish his plan of salvation for all who believe. Is that, is that you this morning? There is no mountain that he will not move. There's no valley that he won't fill in order to redeem you his beloved child. We are his sheep. He is our good shepherd. He is a God who is mighty to save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet your fears by his love. He will exalt over you with singing. He's promised that to you and to me, to all who believe. And he always keeps his promises. So as we go into this Christmas season, let's, let's look forward just like the people of Judah and Isaiah's time, let's look forward to seeing God fulfill his promises. We may face challenges in the days to come, but we can know that our good shepherd will lead us forward. Just as God kept his promise to the people of Judah to send a Messiah, we can trust that he knows exactly what you and I are going through today, and he will lead us through it. Let's join our hearts together in prayer. Father, we, we echo the words of Paul that in Christ Jesus, all the promises of God are yes and amen. Father, you have moved heaven and earth to accomplish your plan of redemption in Jesus Christ. Oh Lord, you are worthy of all glory and honor and praise. Father, help us as we go into the Christmas season this year not to be enamored by glories that fade, that are passing but may we be captivated by your glory that will never fail. O Lord, glorify yourself in us this week, we pray, as we go from this place. In Jesus' name, amen.
Would you stand with me, please? And let's turn to hymn number 133. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Go in peace. Amen.